Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Sundance Books and Music live stream. My name is Emily. I'm the assistant manager here, and I am so happy to introduce today's speakers. Today, we are joined by Amy J. Hammer and Michelle Lasseline, author and illustrator of How to Grow a Baby, a science-based guide to nurturing new life from pregnancy to childbirth and beyond. Their book is available now here at the store, or you can order a copy online at our website, sundancebookstore.com. Amy and Michelle will be joined by moderator Dana Myers-Hook. If you have any questions for our guests during today's live stream, please leave them in the comments and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the discussion. Amy J. Hammer is a writer, mama, and RN, soon to be nurse practitioner. She writes about nourishing food, movement, ecology, and how our relationships to each other and our surrounding shapes are, or, excuse me, let me try that again. How our relationships to each other and our surroundings shape our health. Michelle Lasseline is an interdisciplinary artist hailing from the high desert of Northern Nevada. She holds a BFA from the University of Nevada, Reno. She's been awarded grants from the City of Seattle, the Nevada Arts Council, and the Sierra Arts Foundation, and has exhibited and performed her work at the Nevada Museum of Arts. Dana Myers-Hook is a lactation counselor, educator, and postpartum doula in Reno, Nevada. She has been a volunteer La Leche League leader for 10 years, and welcome everyone to the live stream. Thank you. So much for coming and introducing us, Emily and Dana. I was wondering if you want to get started and ask us questions since you're our moderator and we'll do our best to answer them. That sounds like a great idea. Um, so Amy, why did you decide to write this book and why did you choose Michelle to illustrate it? The second part of that question is really easy. I chose Michelle to illustrate it because she's the most talented artist I know and she's one of my closest friends. and. In working on this project together, it was a way to kind of bring her into my experience. Um, you know, I have two children. She doesn't have children right now. And um, the language that you use to describe your life experiences changes a lot. And so our friendship, I could see, was going to change. And in, in talking to her about uh, babies, but also like placentas and the microbiome and these just bigger, the bigger picture that we were all born uh, not of all of us give birth, but we were all born if we're hanging out right now. Uh, that kind of connected this on this experience um, in a way that's been really profound for me and, and joined us together, uh, kind of a shared understanding and a way to really um, evolve the language of our friendship. Um, the why of writing this book, there's so many reasons why. And I really started not knowing where I was going, but starting with this just total excitement. Um, I have always been a writer. I explored how we use messaging and environmental literature. Do we use humor or do we use this kind of like really uh, this passion that's really serious um, in college? So I've always written and I always wanted to write a book. And this one started the right way where I was just really excited about the information. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, growing a baby is kind of the most average thing you can do, but you still feel like an alien when you're doing it. You're like, <laughs> I'm growing a baby. Everyone's done this apparently, but then you still feel like you're kind of in outer space and it's really fascinating. And so it really started from a place of like, I couldn't stop um, with the information that I was learning, which also seemed to be a little bit different than what information you commonly hear. So, you know, I was like, how does your pelvic floor work and why does alignment matter? Oh, can that affect your birthing process? And why does it matter what shoes you wear? Or what kind of movement you do? Can I prepare? Can I train for this? So a lot of why I write is to deal with my obsessions and my personality, which is I really want to know. I want to know why. I want to understand on a deep level. Um, so writing is this process where you can kind of explore through ideas and start in one place and end up where you didn't know you were going to go. So um, I always think about one of my favorite writers, George Saunders, when I think about the process and the why of writing. And, and he has this quote that's like, 
when you spend a lot of time doing something this laborious and obsessive, which definitely jives with me, um, you kind of end up creating something that's a little better than the you in real life. Uh, so funnier, he says, funnier, kinder, uh, less full of crap, more empathetic, with a clearer sense of virtue, both wiser and more entertaining. And finally, he says, and what a pleasure that is to be on the page less of a dope than usual. And that's how I feel in writing is like I, you start with these notions of like, oh, I understand this. Uh, topic, you know, all of us have this kind of like surface understanding and you start writing about it, you're like, oh, I'm a dope. So I really wrote through that process. And I just, you know, sometimes you write and you, then you read it later and you go, you know, I, that wasn't a good idea. This is when I stayed excited about the whole time. Uh, I was just so, it was just such a joy and fun. And then trying to make it relatable and readable and funny where I could, and I would like to have made it more funny but you have to be a little you know take it a little seriously too for people but yeah I have a long answer it's just that you know this this didn't start from me being um in a place where I'm like I'm an expert and let me tell you how it's done so the even the title how to grow a baby is kind of a play on that because it's like uh you know let's go on this um this let's go together on this journey and kind of explore it and the context of your life and my life is different I think that's really interesting and so um yeah you kind of like ruminate and then come back and edit and just the story that that emerges and then in collaboration with Michelle is so much greater than where it starts um so the writing for me is a way to like it bring people together experience wise but also explore really complex issues um that we you know to a point really dive into in the book um in in a lot of different ways that's my long answer I think that was a great answer. Um, I think the fact that you came to it as someone actually experiencing it versus a expert made it so enjoyable to read. I've obviously read a lot of these kind of books, but it made it so much more enjoyable because it was coming from a place of experience in the moment. Yeah. And I think when you're pregnant, people have a lot of opinions about your experience and they tell you like, oh, it's going to be like this or be prepared for this. And there's a lot of uh, noise coming in. And so I think like, for me, this was kind of like, okay, there's all that information over here. What can I do today? Like, what's, what's my options now to kind of prepare for something? I grew up as a competitive athlete and it was very clear in that sport. Uh, I did, I was a ski racer um, through college and uh, it was very clear in that sport that you could do any, everything you could to get strong and prepare and you couldn't control the outcome. You, sometimes I crashed and sometimes I won and everything in between. And, and birth was such a parallel of, okay, what, but what can I do today? Like if I'm going to worry about tomorrow, what can I do now? I can go for a walk. I can figure out how to convince myself to eat and like healthy food, like beef liver, which people go gross, but okay, wait, why is that my reaction? And can I tell myself a different story? Can I change my own mind? Um, so a lot of that exploration of like, well, what do I have control of and what do I not? And how do I navigate the difference? That's wonderful. Michelle, you are an amazing artist. Um, I loved your art town work for the 2016, uh, art town, the booklet and everything. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Um, how is illustrating this book different from all the other works you've done? A great question. It's in some ways profoundly different because I'm working to represent information with like through the voice of someone else who's Amy rather than being um, a completely like solo act, which is what I've done in most of my visual artwork in the past. Illustrating is really like being that teammate, like support person, like how do we convey this information visually and in what style so that it sets a tone and gives a feeling, but also conveys like factual information. Um, so it was a challenge for me just in learning more about graphic design and like how to, do, how to create an infographic of the graph of the hormonal changes, but then how to like make that fit with the tone of the book, which is um, like Amy said, like sometimes light and humorous, but also like really um, thorough and, and deep. And so that kind of played into the style and learning process for me. Um, 
doing this work was different also because I was representing people, like human people. I almost always represent animals as the stand-in for people in my artwork um, as a way to sort of equate our human animalness in like our experience in nature culture in the world in the more than human world so uh part of the process of making this book was as i said working with amy also working with an editor publisher and professional designer so there's a whole team of people like giving me feedback on the work which on the one hand was like having a, a group of coaches and the other hand it was like having all these boundaries and i was like wow how do i navigate through this and uh, as I went through the book creating illustrations, I sort of found my style for the book and then went back to the beginning and like recreated a certain number of them um, after sort of finding that place between realism, cartoon, illustration, sort of, um, you know, trying really hard to convince everyone that, that people should have animal heads throughout this book and that that just wasn't going to cut it for the actual like it does say science based in the title, so had to give that up. But the rest was really just a positive, encouraging experience. Um, kind of incredible to see it come to fruition and, and work with other people. That's something like as I get older, I seek out more and more is the collaborative projects rather than the kind of solo driven work. And actually, it's funny bringing up the Art Town poster because I feel like that was sort of one first dip of my toe into the world of illustration and collaboration. Um, you know, making something for a community, working with the directors. Um, that poster was also a collaboration with Art Town. Like the, even the idea at its core wasn't just my own. So yeah, this, this book was uh, definitely a um, place of growth for me as an artist. That's amazing. I love hearing the story of you guys becoming teammates. So it kind of just goes so well with the book. <laughs> I love thinking of that. Um, so Michelle, also a second question for you. Um, in our first conversation, you said that you learned a lot from illustrating how to grow a baby. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, I was thinking about that today and I learned so many small details and factual elements, but I think the ones that stick out to me are three things. One, the world of the placenta was opened up to me. It is a beautiful, magical universe all on its own. Googling images of the human placenta blew my mind and I couldn't stop drawing it. I was like, let's make it, let's put it in every image. Um, that was one thing I'll talk about more like with anyone at any time. But the other two things, uh, the other was the way that I learned how like hormones work together during the process of lactation that blew my mind because I was making this graph and watching something that I'm learning through reading that it happens physically, but then I'm actually depicting it and it becomes compositionally in balance and like that I had to make colors weave together that like the visual and the physical just melded in that subject. That was really cool um, in a beautiful like compositional way on the page and I think in the body. Um, and then the third thing that I think I learned about was that idea of matrescence. And I think this is like the biggest takeaway of why this book actually, to me, matters for more than just birthing bodies. But this idea, like anyone even considering birthing a child, like the idea of matrescence, that it's a period of change, not just one moment that you don't give birth and then become a, a parent. It's like this whole uh, change. And I, I even made a note of it on page 180 that Amy wrote, like adolescence, matrescence is a physiological, hormonal, emotional event. And like puberty for adolescence, birthing and caring for a baby deeply and irrevocably changes us. And that just kind of was the first time even I really opened up to the idea of having a baby, which I don't, but um, this book made me understand it in a way that cult, like, like our culture hadn't given me that option. And that was really beautiful that it changed my even like perception and assumptions about the tropes and stereotypes of what it means to, to be a birthing parent. Um, this really expanded that idea. It made it feel more like 
weirdly like going on a walk or something like you you're transformed at the end of it it's really so yeah I took away a lot from the book those are the big top three I think those are amazing top three I think you could also start a whole new thing of uh placenta prints oh my gosh placenta art is big so true gonna be super rad (laughs) um so Amy, while reading the first two or three chapters, um, I often found myself thinking that this completely applied to me and to anybody, especially anybody with a uterus, but literally almost anybody between like the walking and the shoes, all of those things. How do you not shout it from the rooftops and tell everybody about this? I don't think people know that my first four chapters are super sneaky. And then I'm kind of talking to everyone, you know, uh, um, uh, the other reason I really wrote this book is because my husband was making a, um, a film that just came out about my brother who has Down syndrome. And part of our thing with the movie is, and, and his life, he lives with me and my family is, you know, everyone deserves access to healthy food, exercise and movement, um, the outdoors, you know, and so a lot of what gets brought up in these conversations is privilege. And my brother has Down syndrome. He absolutely has that. We fight for him to have that privilege. Um, and so I really am a believer that all bodies deserve access to, these, to this information and, and how to take care of themselves deeply in this world because it's very challenging. It's a really hard place to take care of yourself. And so, yeah, I, if I was uh, better equipped on social media, would probably shout it from the rooftops better. But I'm sometimes pretty busy practicing these things. For me to be okay, it takes a lot of walking and, um, and it, to, to eat well takes a total commitment to food in a way that's really uh, not celebrated in our culture too. So we've really unlearned to value food and our connection to food and bad food is subsidized and uh, good food is associated with privilege and class and it's just backwards. Um, I, I think the best thing to do is spread the information and do everything we can to make everything more accessible to all people. Uh, um, it, just because it's a privilege to have access to those things doesn't mean that they're any more or less valuable to any person. So um, yeah, my brother, he really drives a lot of the work and the messaging we put out there because uh, you know I've fought a lot for him to have access to parts of this world that he would be not allowed in. And so, yeah, those first four chapters are kind of the sneaky way to say like, look, if you have a pelvic floor, which um, gentlemen you do too, uh, the way you move and how you move and the shoes you wear and the activity you choose, it affects your health and it affects how you feel. And uh, later in the book, I talk about it too. Is like, I, I'm not trying to judge your shoes. I'm just trying to, and, and, you know, there was a conversation about that a little bit too. It was like, oh, if you judge high, if you say high heels are bad, people are going to feel judged. And I was like, well, I like them too, but I also believe in geometry. So you can choose to wear high heels, but it doesn't mean that it's not going to change your geometry because any rise on your heel just naturally, I mean, it's just, it's just a geometry thing. Like your heel is up. And so forces change, which I now I, we might be talking about physics. I'm not a, I'm not a math teacher, but let's say we're talking about geometry and physics to make it sound good. Um, yeah, so I think there's some things where there's a lot of ways we get off topic and uh, it becomes less about geometry and more about what I'm saying about what someone chooses to wear. And like it, 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 it kind of negates the point where if you do some of these things that I talk about in the first couple of chapters, like simple things, cultivating your microbiome by spending more time outside in green spaces and trying your best to eat plants and um, healthy food uh, and, you know, um, moving a lot. It's really uh, supportive to our overall health. And it's not new information, but what I think is interesting is like, and we talk about it, I talk about it with patients that I see and I talk about it with people all the time is there's this gap between knowing and doing. So we all have been told things that we think we know, but then the doing is really hard. So what I try to do is say like, okay, now I'm, now, you know this, but how are you going to do it? Like, how are you going to actually move more in your life and in your context that you work full time? Say you're working on a book, um, say you're parenting small children. So it's just like, how do you shape your environment and your life and make little changes that, that increase the movement around you and 
just trying to think a little bit different about how we live uh, in our modern context. So um, I think that maybe covers the question, but I had one friend say, kind of jokingly, it was a, a guy and he said, well, can I grow a baby? I said, well, no, but read chapter four, because we talk about sperm and, you know, the, and so uh, I think not just putting all the emphasis on the birthing parent, but also the birthing support and team and community. And then we get into whole ecology and ecosystem and it all really matters. So it does matter. And I love that the book is like, it's not for someone who just becomes pregnant. Like we could give this to people who are just thinking about it. And I love that, that it, it, it puts it your mind at the beginning before anything has started. Yeah. Yeah. I've had people ask me, is there anything I can do now? Is this a preconception book? And usually it's, you know, like work on kind of change your relationship to food. And that that's like a relationship that's celebratory and maybe a little more in touch with the food that's grown close to you. Um, Cause that's important for so many reasons, but then also movement being a big part of that and, and really cultivating your community and, and your relationship kind of to the natural world to me is a really big part of the book. It is. Um, we have another question and it is in the food that restores section on page 191, you say, remember that hunger, remember that the hunger you are feeling is real and valid. So in this bounce back culture that we find ourselves living in, why is it important to listen to our hunger cues during postpartum? Well, first of all, um, I've never been more hungry than at, like there's this physiological and physical and almost emotional emptiness after you have a baby and you're just hungry. And so there's so much on bounce back and getting your body back. And I just, I can never, I think about food I've never counted calories. I, I think about food as nourishment and after having a baby, that nourishment is so essential. So it's, uh, the bounce back is should, should be focused on like, how do I nourish myself in all my senses? So like, what am I eating? What am I smelling and hearing and feeling and touching? And that's just, you know, we evolved to be very, and we evolved to be in tune with our senses so much so that they affect our entire physiology. Um, it's not like a, um, you know, kind of like a mind body thing I'm making up. It's like, no, these, the, our environment directly, uh, impacts our physiology. And so when you come to food and the food you eat after giving birth, it's kind of the difference between feeling okay and, and held, uh, and, and just not being okay. And, and that was my experience anyways, is like, <laughs> so, you know, I'd have bowls of konji, uh, you know, rice cooked in bone broth. And so it becomes like a soup with eggs. And it just felt like being held because your body feels kind of um, this, this remarkable sense of emptiness, even though your arms are full. I have never been so kind of cold. And just after the baby comes out, like you just are like, I need mom, like a mom or a birthing parent really needs to be held. Um, and food is part of that holding along with support. So. That's so true. And you're hungry 24 seven. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so hungry. <laughs> so hungry. Um, I love how you call pelvic floor therapists, essential mm -hmm. postpartum care providers, because we don't usually reference them that way. Um, why do you think they're essential? And do you ever think that it's going to become more common to have that care postpartum in the United States? Well, Dana, you probably know that that's part of care in other countries. It's just, you, you get sent along to the um, pelvic floor physical therapist. And uh, uh, if I had a lot more finances, I probably would have spent a lot more time with pelvic floor PTs, but I did go to them before or during and after both pregnancies. And I didn't have any pelvic floor uh, damage, but they uh, literally get in touch with an intimate part of your body, your vagina, your um, musculature, your tissues, and by really acknowledging and hands-on and assessing and talking to you about this body part, uh, that kind of gets left behind after you give birth, this body part just went, your body just went through so much by then getting in there, like you feel so, uh, validated. And this, I kind of wrote about that in the book is like, well, it's an acknowledgement of the, what this, what I went through. Um, not to mention that if there are um, if there is pathology, they can give you really valuable information, but 
it's another type of support. It's another type of support for birding parents that we don't usually get. And I really hope it becomes part of the postpartum experience, just standard. All right, you're at, you get, you know, this many visits after you um, give birth to see a pelvic floor PT. I do think it's gaining popularity because I've talked to more people um, who have gone, who have heard of it, or I've told people that they should really go and they're really open to it. So I think, uh, you know, just the, the openness to that body part and um, assessing it as this musculature, you know, but also like it has all these roles that we talk, I talk about in the book too, um, really acknowledging it's, it's really the, the core of our body. It's what's help, holding us here. Um, so yeah, I hope it becomes part of it. And uh, I also really like the idea that you can combine pelvic floor PT. Like I did, I went a couple of times with this kind of global movement, uh, you know, beyond the Kegel, which is just tightening, squatting and walking and moving your body a lot of different ways is a really good way to nurture your pelvic floor and it impacts your whole body and your, your health. I love how you always have those take actions and give us those ideas like squatting and walking and just normal movement during our day that help. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've heard those before. Yeah. I haven't seen that in a lot of baby books. I mean, I, I love the author Katie Bowman and she writes a lot about natural movement. Um, and when you have kids, it's like you can move all day and it's nice to not think like, Oh, I'm not exercising yet. But if you're moving all day, like you should count that. And that's part of living um, a way in a way that where you don't have to be separate to move your body. And that's kind of how we evolved is to, to leave your family and go to the gym can be really nice. And, um, if you get that time, take it, I don't always, uh, I'm, you know, we're busy. And so a lot of times it's carrying, I carried my kids in my arms on hikes and to the playground and everywhere. And, and, uh, and just, you know, become strong in that way, strong enough where I feel like I'm kind of like on the parent training program unintentionally. So, uh, so just redefining movement to incorporate exercise, but also all the movement you do during your day to me is one of the huge, hugest parts of the book. Definitely. Um, Michelle, um, the pelvic floor diagrams that you drew were really intricate and very scientifically, scientifically minded. Did you have a hard time finding what you needed to do those or how was the process for that? Yeah, that's a great question for some of the anatomical and like graphic, like graph elements, especially like with the anatomy. Um, there was a lot of learning through the internet, through books, through um, scientific illustration books. And then I would have Amy sort of edit, like proofread the drawings and, and make sure that everything was up to par like, for you know, just factual, but also that it's representing things in a way that makes sense because no 2D illustration is gonna show what a photograph or a real life like experience of that body part could show. So it's it's almost like it needs to look accurate, but also needs to read accurately. Um, and I think that's more about, that's more where these illustrations landed is that they, read with accuracy they're not photographic in any way they're still watercolor pen and watercolor um and that that was part of the goal too i think that supports the tone of the book which is that this isn't a it isn't a textbook it's a guide and it's narrative and it's open to the context that you were living in so the illustrations kind of reflected that in that they are yeah anatomically correct but then like um, embellished, I would say, not embellished with falsehood, but like embellished with flowers or embellished with color or, you know, like the ornament and the decoration kind of add something in that isn't less serious, but does make it more accessible and open to and like uh, just being part of the story and less of something you can get quizzed on. <laughs> I think we the beauty and the ads on kind of made it so that it drew people in so that you actually looked at it. Cool. We've had friends call that process uh, academic beautification, which is probably my new favorite term. And the pelvic floor one is important um, just because on, I had about, I don't know, 15 pages written on the pelvic floor and all the musculature. And that was about the point where I was like, this is crazy. 
Um, <laughs> and I called it what I called one of my good friends, the academic beautification. Uh, she'd coined that term. And uh, she said, you know, why don't you have like, what about illustrating? What about diagrams? And then we both started talking about our favorite cookbook, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. And then it was like, oh my gosh, we got to make the salt, fat, acid, heat of pregnancy books. And so Michelle and I get on the phone and I'm like, no one's going to read about the pelvic floor, but if you draw it, it's so much more approachable. Well, I, I'm going to read about the pelvic floor, but probably not again for 20, you know, like that many books and that many pages. So the pelvic floor was kind of our turning point of like, we, we both jumped into this project and I was like, Michelle, come with me. Um, and that just was like one of the, the illustrations that makes the most sense to illustrate because it's a moving, living, breathing in your body. So it has a dynamicism that, I mean, words certainly don't really capture it um, and, and illustrations capture it better. Definitely. It was wonderful. So my last question for you guys, can we expect any more projects from the both of you? Yes. <laughs> Michelle and I are very good students who so will never stop, stop working. Um, my second book is coming out next year, maybe. It's all about menstrual cycles and hormonal health uh, with, cook, with recipes, same amount of uh, science, but it goes from um, the beginning of the menstrual cycle, basically to the end. So through reproductive years, the menopausal transition and post-menopause, which delighted me in that I had the most fun writing about writing those chapters and thinking about the menopausal transition. Um, so kind of for our friends who don't want to grow a baby and who are menstruating, that book will come out. And then uh, after that, I have some a lot more ideas and Michelle and I both are people who have a million projects at the same time. So she has a lot going on right now too. Do you yeah. want to share this with us, Michelle? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm finishing my, my MFA in fine art. So I have uh, kind of projects cooking for that and, um, how it's like being put on the spot to, to say all the things that I'm thinking about all day long before this. Um, I am recreating a pattern of a hood that Georgia O'Keeffe wore. It was made in the 1920s and I saw it at the Nevada Museum of Art. And so I'm looking through images of this woolen hood to keep you warm in the winter. Um, that's just really specific. I also am running a business that I've done for the last eight years called uh, You as an Animal. And I draw portraits of people as animals of their choice. And I do this for events and markets and uh, at the Reno uh, Sun, uh, Riverside Farmers Market last week, but mostly in the Seattle area. Um, so that's an ongoing performance project that hopefully will never end. I love it. It's wonderful. Do you guys have any projects together? I'm always brainstorming because it's, it's such a wonderful thing to work with Michelle. Um, mostly because it forces her to talk to me for hours every week, which is really nice. Um, but also working on the book was not lonely and uh, it was such a good collaboration, which I don't know if they all work out like that, but Michelle and I, um, we kind of seem to experience the world and delight in it in similar ways. And so I think uh, even if we have our own projects going on, I'm always looking for ways to work together on, on things or, um, yeah, I'm always brainstorming. So we're always talking about kind of ideas and projects and kind of being on the same page. And so for me, I'm always thinking about ways to bring our work together. Uh, this was a real gift for me to get to work with her on this. It, it felt like a total, um, lot. I won the lottery well, uh, by getting to work with Michelle. Also, just to add to that, um, there is this moment from not having being published to like being published as an author or illustrator that takes so much work and time and effort and we're really lucky to have this opportunity with Roost and Shambhala and that we got to choose each other and work on this together and that they accepted that proposal was unbelievable and now I feel like having surpassed that hurdle we just have so many more opportunities in the future to do more projects like for me having an author friend opens up so many opportunities for future publishing and I think for Amy like 
working with me doing illustration has like kind of similar effect that it's really collaborative it's really complementary so I think there will be more I sure hope so hanging out <laughs> forever <laughs> all I care about. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Amy, were you going to read some from your book for us? We would sure. all love to hear I've some. At, I've been reading chapter five, um, the beginning of it, not the whole chapter that would take a long time. But uh, before I start reading, I suppose I've chosen this because this opening to chapter five, because uh, a lot of people see the title and say, oh, it's not for me or I'm not growing a baby. I don't want to grow a baby. I don't want to know anything about babies. Uh, so chapter five is kind of the like, well, you know, let's look at language and how we tell stories because actually that applies to all of us, but especially when you're growing a baby, um, this narrative, this cultural narrative gets given to you. And uh, it's, it's part of my impetus to kind of um, look at it from a different angle and maybe uh, challenge it a little bit. And it's also where this book kind of takes a turn from maybe what to expect uh, and kind of rephrases how you're going through this experience. So, so this is kind of, a, this is a chapter that both goes into physiology, anatomy, movement, supporting communities, food, all of those things. But I open it with how we tell our origin stories. And I love origin stories, but this is how, um, I thought about it when I was writing and when I was pregnant. So this is chapter five, the first trimester. Scientists, teachers, and parents have taught us about fertilization or how you got here using many stories and metaphors. Parents might say babies are brought in by storks or they might use the birds and the bees metaphor. Of this problematic interspecies metaphor, a 10-year-old Bart Simpson said, the sun is out, birds are singing, Bees are trying to have sex with them, as is my understanding. While these metaphors attempt to explain reproduction to children and miss the crucial ingredient, sex between humans, other metaphors that leave much to be desired are used by grown-ups to teach other grown-ups about reproduction. While the last chapter examined the health of people who produce sperm because they are often left out of the story about reproduction and growing babies, there is one key event in which they play a the starring role. The story of fertilization, or when sperm and egg meet and join, is a sperm-centric tale shaped by cultural stereotypes of masculine and feminine. The stories we tell and the metaphors we use are important because they reinforce the truths and beliefs we hold as a culture. I propose shifting away from a male-dominated story of fertilization and rethinking the way we visualize the forming of a new person. Perhaps if our origin story is one of interaction and gender equity, our culture and imagination will naturally shift toward an appreciation of balance over domination and nuance over strictly defined gender roles. For successful fertilization to occur, both egg and sperm actively participate. Despite this requirement of mutual involvement, both mainstream media and scientific literature fall into gender descriptions and fairy tale stories to describe this event. The sperm in this telling is a superhero or a knight in shining armor. Meanwhile, the egg is a damsel in distress who is waiting for her sperm to rescue her from demise. In almost all medical textbooks, the story of sperm and egg, the story of sperm and egg reads much like the Disney version of Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty. Handsome, brave sperm journeys to rescue helpless princess. While the sperm is celebrated and applauded for its harrowing egg penetrating journey, the egg is shrouded in mundane language. When a sperm cell dies, it perishes. But when an egg cell dies, it disintegrates or degenerates. A quiet disappearance versus the tragic loss of the heroic sperm. Sperm are talked about like the men they supposedly represent. That is, with great reverence and importance whereas eggs tend to have shorter explanations about their role in fertilization. Eggs are to be fertilized, sperm do the fertilizing. The egg is passive or worse, a non-participatory fortress while the sperm is all action and bravado. We can't help but attribute masculinist symbolism to sperm and dependent receptiveness to the egg. This metaphor of the soldiering sperm and the helpless egg might seem like a relatable way to tell the story of fertilization. The problem with this telling is that it creates a sense that our innate selves are defined by cisgender and patriarchal stereotypes. 
with men acting as inherent or deserving conquerors and women as victims who needs rescuing. The other problem with the story is that it's not quite biologically accurate. There's another story with slightly different metaphors you may have heard. When scientists discovered that sperm aren't the speediest swimmers, their forward thrust is weak while their side to side force is quite strong, sperm were described as hapless armies of tiny man organisms who don't know where they're going and are too proud to ask for directions. Scientists discovered that the egg has distinct physical and chemical properties that influence fertilization. No longer defined by passivity, the egg was now an aggressive sperm trapping spider woman who selects a worthy sperm and imprisons it, imprisons it as it attempts to escape. Now the sperm was the victim and the egg was a woman who trapped a man against his will. Slightly different gender stereotypes inform this story. The egg's active role is associated with women's power and manipulation, bringing to mind witchery and sorcery to procreate. This idea, even more than the other, frightens our culture that values masculinity and control. Emily Martin, a cultural anthropologist from Stanford, was one of the first people to illuminate how cultural conditioning and gender stereotypes influence biologists' male-centric descriptions of sperm and reproductive health. She argued that this point of view impacts how information and research is interpreted and the kind of questions researchers ask. If scientists assume the egg is passive, they won't look for chemicals it releases or possesses that drive the action of fertilization. If the sperm are in charge and do the penetrating, we won't wonder how the egg is involved in this process. In other words, our stories and stereotypes are shaped by history and culture, and we can't readily ask questions or see what we're missing if we fail to imagine that other stories are possible. In her paper on the subject written in 1991, Martin looked at the standard textbooks used by pre-medical and medical students and noticed that the story of reproduction was told using celebratory language for sperm, whose production is admired for its abundance and called remarkable. Meanwhile, words like debris and shedding describe menstruation. Ovulation, a process that is more analogous to sperm production, is likewise discussed with lackluster morbidity. The book celebrated how cisgender men are endless sperm producing machines and lamented the limited nature of women's eggs, which decline in number over time. Metaphors and stories aren't the problem. These creative tools help us comprehend biological processes and build an imaginative understanding of events we can't see. But there is a problem when our origin story celebrates traditional ideas of masculinity and minimizes roles associated with femininity. The stories we tell can perpetuate inequality or shift us toward mutual respect and understanding. In my own undergraduate textbook on anatomy and physiology, the author said the sperm must breach the egg's defenses before the egg can be penetrated, even though the book does a good job explaining that true fertilization occurs only when both chromosomes combine. It can't help but craft a conquering story of adventuring and penetrating sperm and leave out the qualities of the egg. Biologist Scott Gilbert doesn't describe fertilization as a battle involving the force of the sperm and the wilds of the egg. In the widely used textbook he wrote, Developmental Biology, he says fertilization is like a dialogue between sperm and egg. In this chapter, Fertilization, he quotes Walt Whitman and Charles Darwin, indicating that this event is characterized by a mix of poetry and science. I like the idea of biological poetry taking place in my uterus. Elaborating on the nature of the dialogue between sperm and egg, Gilbert states, the egg activates the sperm metabolism that is essential for fertilization and the sperm reciprocates by activating the egg metabolism needed for the onset of development. His description illustrates that the egg and the sperm are both drivers of this process of fertilization and both have essential jobs to perform that depend on reciprocation, not force or domination. So that's the beginning of uh, the first trimester. If you haven't thought about it before. Um, and then, so part of, I just wanted to add is that these are the illustrations and the language that Michelle used and what we chose to use was the union, um, which is different than, you know, we, we took anatomical drawings and kind of rewrote the story with more accurate uh, biology. Um, and so there's a tone shift there where instead of saying, a lot of us will say, hey, you're pregnant. What's up, girl? 
Uh, this book is much more like, here's what's happening and here's how we've thought about it and maybe we should think about it differently. And then the, the illustrations uh, depict that as well. So that's one of my favorite parts um, to, to share because I hope it's a little bit surprising and, and um, it's also fun to read, <laughs> so yeah. You didn't think you were going to get Bart Simpson in How to Grow a Baby, but you did. I was like, here's my joke. Well, I had a bunch of sperm jokes in there and then it's like, oh, so that's a little bit easy. But yeah, it was really a delight to see that Bart Simpson joke. <laughs> to get any jokes in this baby book was a real achievement. Um, you know, made it through a lot of rounds. <laughs> it ended up in the final copy. So they're in there. Go look for them. Um, does anyone else have, Dana, any other questions or I know we're getting close on time. Is there any other sections that you wanted to talk about or any other questions? Um, I don't have any more questions, but, um, I would love to hear, um, how your partner, is it Max, uh, was helpful or not helpful in, uh, the part about gonads and that section. Because I love that you use the word gonads. <laughs> There's a really good radio lab. It's all about gonads. I highly recommend. Um, so, so Max, you know, I kind of tease him throughout the book in a loving way. And uh, and and before we go into gonads, he uh, he read this book more more than anyone, and he's this excellent uh, editor. And um, he was a good test to see is this interesting for you because you'll never birth a human you know, in this, in this current scientific climate anyways, uh, but he read through it and, you know, he would, he would kind of tell me, Hey, this is a, this is, this is too sciencey. And so this book got more and more relatable and understandable and approachable really because of him, um, and our, in our, uh, passionate arguments <laughs> about writing and projects, you know, it's really important to have someone you can argue with lovingly, um, while you work on something. And we really feel that for each other, but, uh, the, the sperm, the protect the gonad section, I think is what you're talking about. And it's kind of this reflection on, you know, I have a lot of friends that go that bike ride and, um, you know, for long hours and, and men that don't really, uh, or people that wear tight pants. Uh, and so kind of made a couple of jokes there, but also look, a lot of the theme is, you know, in life, in this living in this world, you cannot avoid you can avoid tight pants, to be honest, but you can't avoid all bad. Um, you can't avoid everything that's going to damage your health. You can walk in the street and a diesel car goes by and blows fumes in your in your face, and you're like, "Oh man, I was eating. I ate an organic apple for this." So a lot of the book is, you know, you can't avoid all bad, but it's it doesn't mean it's not worth seeking and enjoying the delight and pleasure. And so a lot of the gonads part is like, look the choices we make if, as long as we find this balance like he he went on this crazy long bike ride um on 395 from Reno to Mount Whitney and again on a and his you know gonads are getting heat shot po heat shot proteins and um but then he's, you know, he's like in a beautiful wild place and, and mountains and moving his body and eating sardines maybe maybe just wild salmon I don't know if he really brought sardines he told me he ate sardines make me happy I probably but yeah so it's just I quote Gary Snyder throughout this book too one of my favorite writers because he has this whole um quote about you know when the world's getting you down and uh you feel like it's kind of trying to kill you uh you can still go out and go on a walk and kind of get perspective you need to to really find just total delight in this world we live in so it's it's both um I have a whole chapter of environmental toxins and about how we do, we live in two worlds when you're pregnant, you're, you're kind of threatened by everything. Um, but also you're, and so you're more vulnerable to everything, but also, you know, you're, you're the most safe place the baby can be. So kind of how we choose to live in the world, the way it is, is really, is not ignoring the problems. It's, it's seeing that they're two, you're kind of like, they co-inhabit. There's not just one or the other, but there's a lot of overlap, um, be between good and bad and, and nuance. So I think you covered that really well. And I really appreciated that part of the book that made it more relatable and more real life. Yeah. And, you know, I think um, it just, right in writing that too, I had a moment where I, you know, I looked kind of had this look at my own, could look at my own life and think about, 
okay, this is what I'm writing. What is, how is that reflective around me? And, and it's really nice when writing comes back to you and reminds you to live in accordance to it. So that was helpful. But I think a lot of books want to skip over uh, or not scare us. And I, I think I put it in here too. Of I, had, I was writing a, an article one time for a magazine about water. And I talked to a hydrologist and he told me, water is an expression of our environment. It's everything around us. And uh, so that's the good and the bad, he said. And so I put it in this piece. So I was like, that's a beautiful quote. And my editor was like, people aren't going to want to drink the water. They're going to be scared. And uh, so disappointed because it's so, it's so important to recognize that the truth of that and the pregnant body and breast milk, those are the same thing. Like there's, there's, there's toxins in our breast milk and there's total nourishment in our breast milk and same in the pregnant body. This is the world we live in. I, I think it's important to be informed, um, but not frozen and, you know, knowledgeable, but also live it, able to live in the present moment and see forward and have plans and aspirations, but then come back to the needs of the day. So there's a lot of, there's just so much going on all the time. Like we, we def, we need strategies um, to navigate through the world we live in. I have a quick question, if that's all right. Um, so for those of us who aren't growing babies, who have never grown a baby and who are probably maybe not going to grow a baby, what is the best way we can support the people in our lives who are either planning to, are currently growing a baby or are postpartum? Yeah, I, uh, before I had children to after I wanted to tell a lot of people like, oh, sorry, I had no idea. Uh, there's a lot of good recommendations. I want Michelle to talk about biological empathy after I'm done too. But, um, uh, you know, like, I think the big things are how can I bring you food or what, like, there's this quote that like, when you're, when you visit a, a pregnant or a person who's just had a kid, like you're, you're on staff, you're not really a visitor, which I, you know, I didn't really see it that way with friendships, but I, you know, now that I'm further in and I have two children and Michelle and I have remained such close friends, I really think that those kind of immediate after having a baby, um, that advice is really good, but it takes a special person to come into a world of a person who has small children. Um, and so a lot of that is like Mich when Michelle comes over, she enters my world really well uh, and is willing to play with my kids and have them show, they show her everything. And, and um, I, don't, I don't think that's for every single friendship or, but, if, but, but a way to support has been for her to like be willing to see my world and talk about it. Uh, you know, and maybe you could work on a whole book with them would be really supportive. <laughs> That's my joke. But um, I, 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 uh, it's, I think it's really challenging because you entered a little bit different world. And Michelle and I have talked about this a lot of like, you can visit your friend's world, but you kind of can't inhabit it if you don't have kids, because it's really hard to explain like, how consuming it is to have little children. Um, so I think just kind of like the empathy back and forth of like, or even just being like, look, our friendship right now has changed, but I'll still be here. Like when your kids are old enough that you can like hang out or go on a walk also way lower expectations. Like, Hey, do you want to go for a walk and for 20 minutes and maybe our conversation is going to get cut off a thousand times. Um, I think for me, it, like that's how it's worked with friends, people who kind of delight, I, we delight in each other's lives, even though they're different and value each other's stories. Uh, that's been the most important thing and, and not getting hurt feelings. And if someone doesn't call me back for five months, I have no, I have no problem with it. So I already kind of was like that before, but Michelle, do you think you would talk a little bit, was it biologically, biological empathy or reproductive empathy that you shared recently? Do you remember? I don't remember, but um, I think that, uh, the best support that I felt like through the book, through reading the book and learning the book was just remembering that idea of matrescence, that there is a period that my friend is going through. It's not that she's different now than she was before, as of one moment, it's this whole transition period. And um, for both, you know, any friend, like the birthing parent or the support, you know, the non-birthing parent, that there is um, like, not to focus on any experience of like difference, but actually to be excited and like 
empathetic for that change. And I personally just really look forward to spending time with Amy's kids and all of my friends who have children because I really, in all of my own art practice, try my hardest in life. It's like my life's mission to lessen the gap between childhood and adulthood. I don't think there's a gap and it's actually the saddest thing to me when someone's like, well, you're a grown up. I'm like, since when? No, thank you, no. Um, but like, I, I think that's the really important part is not to see that like, oh, a diaper bag, this isn't my world anymore. Instead, just be like, what is this other human at a different state in its human animal life? doing and what does it mean for me as another human in its environment and that means like if I see Amy taking off her shoes when she goes in her house then I replicate that or like if I notice that she's yeah that her family eats these certain things I'll bring that as a gift and just try to like contribute to that like almost microbiome of her environment in a way that's like the best support um that but yeah I just I'm, I'm not someone who walks around saying like I love kids. I'm just like, I love animals. I love human animals. I love young ones. I love old ones. So I think that's like a big part of the support. And I think that the, the book um, really talks about, there is a specific section in the book that talks about what support actually is. It doesn't mean, I think Amy writes about it really beautifully. It's not like, oh, I did this for you. Oh, thank you. It's like, you just do it. And then that person doesn't even notice it, maybe, but you see that it helps them, and then you do it again. And it's like an unspoken kind of support. And that's the most important kind, really, to just be like, I don't know. I've sat for like many hours in the back seat of Amy's car with like a blood curdling screaming child, and I'm just like, it's fine. My eardrums are fine. It's uh, fine. <laughs> that's fine. That's not the worst thing I could be doing. At least it wasn't a puking child. No, Did anything nice. I'm just like, oh, whoops, I'm I'm not around for that. Um, I think that's those are really good, thoughtful answers. Thank you. I just had, we had one more question for Dana, which was um, kind of just how this book maybe you'll end up how you plan to use it in your work or share it or if it if it's different or how it's different than other resources you've used. Just as curiosity. That is a great question. It is very different. Number one, because it comes from such a place of equity, which I really, really appreciate it. Um, a lot of books aren't as open in their language or in the fact that um, couples work together differently than they used to in some books. Um, I also, um, like I, I think I've told you is that I love your lists and your, um, I, food ideas. And I think those would be amazing to share with my clients and friends and people who have babies, because having a quick view of something easy that you don't have to think through is so helpful when you are having a baby and you don't have all the brain cells to, you know, put towards this. Um, I also, so like I've read a lot of books and so I have a lot of books and, um, and I enjoy offering books to people, but I can see where this one is actually going to become one of those books that it's like, this is a must have. These are, you know, I have some books that are like, this would be nice to have. This one is on this, if you need this, but this one is an overall book that I would suggest, um, for people to buy. That means a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for letting me participate today. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah and thank you all for being here. And hi to your cat who just walked in. I, I, I really know, glad like, oh, that... <laughs> you didn't notice. <laughs> Glad that she made a, an appearance. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Amy, Michelle, and Dana for being here and having this conversation. It was so, so edifying to sit in on this and um, just so glad you could all be here. And once again, if you're in the Reno area or Northern Nevada, you can get their book, How to Grow a Baby, uh, here at Sundance or on our website, sundancebookstore.com. And thank you for watching, everyone, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>